happy uh, to leave my snowy garden behind for a couple of days and, and uh, enjoy some beautiful tropical weather here in Panama. 30 years ago, the World Health Assembly announced uh, that polio would be targeted for uh, eradication uh, globally. And as has been mentioned in the last couple of uh, in talks already, in that 30 years, uh, some amazing uh, progress has been made from uh, at the time of the declaration, there were more than 120 countries where polio was endemic and had never been interrupted, uh, upwards of 350,000 uh, childhood, oh, I'm one ahead. Where's that? North, uh, it's not moving. Sorry. <laughs> this one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, got it now. Uh, you know, and upwards of 350,000 children were paralyzed every year, uh, many of whom wouldn't survive or would face a lifetime of disability in countries that didn't have any resources to support them. Today, uh, there are only three countries where polio remains uh, endemic and uninterrupted, uh, and the cases are numbered in sort of fives and tens. In fact, so far this year in 2018, there have only been 19 cases, all of which have occurred in Pakistan and Afghanistan. But despite all those accomplishments, there's still a long road ahead, uh, and there are many challenges that we face before we can declare polio uh, irrevocably eradicated from the globe. And, and along that road, there are a number of vulnerabilities that could threaten the, in, the entire campaign and all the accomplishments to date. And that's what I want to spend some time uh, talking about today. A central theme uh, that, that uh, runs through uh, much of the, the, the polio eradication endgame plans in our talk today is the need to get rid of oral polio vaccine. Uh, and just to remind, I'm sure the audience and you all know well, but just to remind you that there are really two fundamental flaws, or two Achilles heels of oral polio vaccine. The first and probably most significant from the eradication campaign is that the, the possibility of oral polio vaccine reverting back to neurovirulence uh, and then, then tr transmitting in communi communities known as uh, circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses, CVDPVs. And uh, outbreaks of CVDPVs have occurred uh, uh, in a number of places uh, all over the world uh, in the past couple of decades. And, and the cases of Paralysis caused by CVDPVs are indistinguishable from paralytic polio from wild type virus. And so we really can't ever say we've eradicated polio until we've gotten rid of this possibility and rid of the world of those oral polio vaccines as well. The other flaw in o OPV, oh, sorry, I gotta push the wrong button. The, the other flaw in oral polio virus is its tendency to cause paralysis in vaccine recipients or close contacts known as vaccine-associated uh, paralytic polio, or VAP. This is a figure uh, looking at para uh, paralytic polio cases in the US in the last 20 years of the 20th century. The total cases are graphed in the line above, and the bars reaching up to that are those caused by vaccine. And as you can see, the vast majority, in fact, all cases in the US after 1993 were caused by vaccine. And this is a situation that has been mirrored in uh, in, in many countries around the world, including in Latin America, and has made continuation of oral polio vaccine and in the persistent risk of VAP intolerable. Uh, and, uh, and is really a, 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 probably not a vulnerability to the overall campaign, but a driver of urgency in many areas of the world to, to move away from oral polio vaccine. So if the transition away from OPV is, is the central theme of the eradication endgame strategy from here, where are we now? This is a schematic uh, describing the 2013 to 2018 eradication strategic plan. And, and there are a couple of key events on there. The first is the introduction of IPV, uh, at least one dose of IPV uh, for all countries uh, particularly focused on those that have been using OPV as the primary strategy, and that has been accomplished in most areas of the world. The second main event is the switch from trivalent OPV to bivalent OPV. 
which was successfully done in a global coordinated effort in 2016. The next major step is this one with this sort of a question mark of when that's going to happen, which is the withdrawal of all OPVs. And it, it, we're waiting for cessation of wild type poliovirus in the world, which has been uh, a, 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 a tough struggle for those last cases. And so we find ourselves you know, right in this phase here after the switch and prior to cessation of OPV use. And what I'd like to do with the last, uh, with the rest of the talk is, is discuss the data that informs how this strategy is going to work and what those persistent vulnerabilities might be. I'm also going to tell this story through research conducted in Latin America. And, and it, it's remarkable. There's, there's research into the, you know, optimal vaccine strategies taking place all over the world. But uh, so much of the important data that we use to inform our campaign has come from Latin America, and that it's really possible to tell this story using research uh, from this region, and, and uh, so I'm going to try to do that for the most part. But it's not to discount, you know, all the very important work taking place elsewhere. I'm just going to organize the discussion in, uh, in sort of three general areas, and I want to start with decisions about optimal use of IPV in high transmission countries following the OPV switch. High transmission countries are generally characterized by decreased population immunity, which stems from a number of factors, both biologic and socioeconomic. I've got to remember to push the right button. And this is compounded by poor water hygiene uh, sanitation conditions, uh, and barriers to effective surveillance, both for paralysis as well as environmental polioviruses. And what you get then is, is a strategy that's influenced by an emphasis on affordability, alignment with the EPI schedule in order to maximize uptake, and to focus on mucosal immunity, which is the portion of polio immunity that uh, serves to limit spread of polioviruses uh, in communities. The result in many areas has been a schedule that looks like this, with bivalent OPV at 6, 10, and 14 weeks, and a single dose of IPV uh, at 14 weeks. So what, are the, what data do we have that can inform how this strategy may work and what its vulnerabilities are? Uh, much of uh, kind of the critical answers to those questions actually has come from uh, a study that we completed in four countries in Latin America, uh, in uh, 2014 20, uh, and, and early 2015 um, in Guatemala, uh, Panama with Dr. Saez Lorenz and uh, Dominican Republic uh, and, uh, and in Colombia and led by Dr. Edwin Asturias. Uh, and, and this study looked at children vaccinated uh, at 6, 10, and 14 weeks with bivalent OPV followed by either one dose of IPV at 14 weeks uh, or two doses of IPV at 14 and 36 weeks. And as, as was predicted from previous studies looking at IPV following trivalent uh, OPV, the ser serologic responses to type 1 and type 3, which are contained in all those vaccines, uh, in both vaccines, were robust. But the critical questions were around serotype 2 conversion, because uh, the, in these schedules, the only specific serotype 2 protection comes from the IPV. The serologic responses in this study are outlined in these two figures. On your left, you can see the seroconversion rates after the single dose of IPV. Uh, and to start with, the key time point probably in this graph is the middle bar on the histogram, uh, which measures the seroconversion rates after a single dose of IPV. Uh, and you can see that the levels reached about 80%. There was a little bump in seroconversion following a, a, a monovalent OPV2 challenge, which suggested that a small subset of kids who didn't seroconvert were primed, but the, the key number really is this 80%. 80% was perhaps an encouraging result in some regards, but somewhat disappointing from the perspective of, uh, uh, of the global eradication campaign, especially when compared in context with the responses that you can get out of a second dose of IPV, which are shown on the right side there. And again, the middle bar here is seroconversion at 36 weeks before the second dose, which is again around 75, 80%. But the second dose of IPV achieved essentially 100% seroconversion uh, in, in all kids. 
This, there was a study that followed this from Pakistan using a very similar methodology in assessing the zero conversion rates after the schedule of uh, BOPV 61014 and when a single IPV. And again, the, the authors of this study showed very high serotype 1 and 3 uh, zero conversion, but lower serotype 2. And, in, and uh, in this study, they were just barely over 50 percent. Uh, and uh, so, this raises the question of what's the driver of these suboptimal serotype 2 uh, responses? And there are a number of, of factors that probably play into this, but prominent among those is the influence of maternal antibody. We had the opportunity to take the data from the Latin American trial and look at the influence of maternal antibody. And what you see graphed here uh, is the seroprotection, so actual levels of protective antibody over time according to the maternal antibody status before the first dose of IPV. So children in red here are those that were seronegative, a low maternal antibody, and the blue is the seropositive, a higher maternal antibody. And what you can see here, the, probably the first important point to look at is on the, at the, uh, near the right side at the 36-week time point prior to the second IPV, the, there was a significant difference. Only 60% of infants who had maternal antibody were seroprotected at that time point compared to over 80% uh, among those with uh, low maternal antibody. And again, similar to the findings in the big trial, in the, in the main trial, uh, the second dose of IP, IPV overcame any potential influence of maternal antibody when given at 36 weeks. This study also provided some critical information about another question that, uh, that is of major significance after the transition from uh, bi trivalent to bivalent OPV. which is what's the impact of this strategy on mucosal immunity? And as you know, IPV alone does not generate mucosal immunity. Um, and in, the, in this current schedule, the only uh, vaccine against serotype 2 specifically is the IPV. Um, but there, is the, uh, there was a hypothesis that there could be cross-reactivity among children given bivalent OPV uh, and that they might then generate some mucosal immunity. And that was indeed what we discovered. The graph on the left shows mucosal immunity as measured by stool shedding of virus after a monovalent type 2 challenge. And the shedding index, or the amount of shedding, is shifted to the left, is slightly decreased in the children who received one dose of IPV. It was fairly subtle change, but statistically significant. But more meaningful, you, uh, there was a much bigger drop after the two doses of IPV, as you can see there. The actual clinical and, and epidemiologic ramifications of this shift are unknown, but certainly what you see demonstrated is that the second dose of IPV is also continuing to enhance whatever mucosal immunity we're able to derive. And actually, when you look back at the, at the rationale for the introduction of IPV into OPV schedules at 14 weeks, it was clear that stakeholders were worried about maternal antibody. But what we've demonstrated in these studies and, and elsewhere is that even for, at 14 weeks, there is still a significant negative influence in maternal antibody. And this is reflected in, uh, in recent discussions and recent recommendations from the SAGE polio working group here uh, who met this winter and are now recommending a minimum of two doses of IPV. Uh, and uh, that, that can be a full or fractional dose, as we'll talk about in a minute. And the first dose given at four months and the second dose at least four months later, ideally uh, perhaps timed with that nine-month MMR in many countries. Um, but this is really a response to the influence of maternal antibody that's still persistent at that 14 weeks. So then let's make a transition to the considerations of vaccine strategy in low transmission countries, uh, such as many in Latin America. Low transmission countries are generally characterized by much better population immunity through a number of factors, but perhaps most prominently through higher rates of vaccination. And uh, you know, better surveillance, improved conditions leads to an overall reduced susceptibility to circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus transmission. And as CVDPV transmission and, and certainly wild poliovirus cases fade from memory, 
the risk of VAP is ever present uh, and becomes increasingly intolerable, as we mentioned before. And so strategies then are then uh, developed, placing an emphasis on a reduction in VAP and boosting humoral or individual protection. And uh, many uh, schedules look like uh, these two examples here, beginning with IPV, which is demonstrated to reduce the rates of VAP significantly by providing some humoral immunity prior to exposure to the oral polio vaccines. The number of IPVs in these types of schedules are really dictated by resources, as we've just uh, mentioned and we've heard a, a number of times. It actually, some of the vulnerabilities and some of the, uh, you know, the, the, the evidence of the effectiveness of these strategies comes from another wonderful clinical trial undertaken at the same time uh, in Latin America, in Chile, uh, led by Miguel Orion, um, and in, in this study, uh, children were given uh, one of three schedules, an IPV uh, followed by two bivalent OPVs, or two IPVs followed by one uh, bivalent OPV, or all IPVs, and the, the vaccines were given at two, four, six months. And again, uh, it, like the previous studies, they were very robust serotype 1 and 3 uh, responses, but the critical questions were about serotype 2. And I, I, just to point you to the kind of the key places to look at on these two figures on the left in the histogram, at the 28 week, week uh, time point after all the vaccines were completed, you can see that the children in yellow who received only uh, one dose of IPV had much lower rates of seroconversion than the red, which are the two IPVs, and certainly the green with the three IPVs. And that's reflected in differences in uh, antibody titers here, uh, graphed on the right with the blue reflecting the single IPV dose and the other two lines overlapping uh, the two or three IPV groups. We had an opportunity to explore the, the reasons for some of those disparities, again, in our analysis of maternal antibodies, and very similarly found that maternal antibody status at the time of the first IPV had a significant negative influence on, uh, on sero protection, in this case, uh, uh, you know, after the completion of the full series. And similar to our previous findings, a second dose of IPV given at four months uh, overcame any interference of maternal antibody. So if there has been a theme to lots of these discussions uh, so far, it's that one dose of IPV may leave us with significant vulnerabilities. But once we make the decision or once the recommendation is, is made to, to administer two or more IPVs, you immediately run up to, against another barrier, which has already been discussed, which is maintaining an adequate supply of IPV. There have been a number of approaches to try to uh, mitigate this challenge. Perhaps most prominent among those is the development of the use of fractionated intradermal IPV doses, as uh, Dr. Savio just mentioned. The, there, you know, the, one of the original studies demonstrating immunogenicity of these was undertaken in, in Cuba and has been subsequently replicated elsewhere. One can generally say that full-dose IPV does give you better serial responses than fractionated IPVs, but Perhaps a critical question of how they might be used is answered in this uh, figure from a meta-analysis of these studies, comparing two doses of the intradermal fractionated IPV with a single dose of, uh, full dose of uh, IPV. And in general, those two doses are much more immunogenic than the single dose. And so this is very encouraging as we progress towards that recommendation for multiple doses and will help uh, stretch our supply significantly. It does, however, raise another question that immediately becomes a barrier, which is that the technical requirements for administering a fractionated intradermal dose are much higher, uh, particularly higher than the, the usual amount of skill required to give an oral polio vaccine. Uh, and this may be a significant limitation, but fortunately there's been a number of efforts to develop uh, either needle adapters or, more recently, transcutaneous uh, injectors that, that may uh, ameliorate some of this concern, but uh, uh, this is obviously still a remaining challenge as we transition to more and more fractionated doses. The other area that has been uh, of major importance or that may be of major importance going forward in terms of the manufacture 
of uh, uh, supply uh, limitations of, uh, of IPVs is the development of Sabin IPVs. So the, the Salk IPV that has been used traditionally is uh, manufactured from three wild type polio strains. And the biocontainment requirements for the manufacture of IPV are such that they really limit the, the possibility of doing those in uh, in, in any country that has, uh, you know, the, the uh, factors that might lead to high polio transmission. Uh, and so the development of IPV from the Sabin strains may allow us to increase capacity for manufacturing if we can accomplish the, the right technology transfer in many more places. And this may go further than anything else in terms of figuring out how to provide enough IPV where it's necessary. The figures here uh, are just looking at uh, immune responses following uh, Sabin IPVs of different doses and uh, adjuvants compared to the yellow, uh, which are the sort of pre-vaccination status, uh, uh, and the blue line, which is uh, vaccine responses from wild polio virus-related IPV, the Salk IPV. And there are really two take-home points here. One is that the Sabin IPVs are immunogenic. And the other one, which is more subtle but may have some actual advantage long term, is that the IPVs tend to respond more, uh, more strongly to the strain from which they were developed. So Sabin IPVs may actually have some advantage uh, immunologically against the circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses, which are going to be the primary target in the end game. This brings up, I think, just to the, the points that I want to close with, are that, that you know, much of what we've talked about so far and what has been done in polio eradication is, is trying to find the right way to use the tools we already have in our armamentarium from a vaccine standpoint. But what can we do in these last stages of polio eradication to improve that armamentarium? And there have been a number of innovations already that, uh, that are coming online in that area. Two trials, just to, to mention, uh, one is looking at uh, adjuvanted uh, fractional doses, which may get past that you know, sort of uh, you know, single dose suboptimal uh, serologic conversion uh, that we see that we need multiple doses of fractionated IPV. And a study conducted in the Dominican Republic uh, here showed uh, uh, that the adjuvants can really be uh, powerful tools to boost the effect of those fractionated doses. And then another example, uh, actually a clinical trial, again run by Dr. Saez Lorenz here in, uh, in Panama, looking at a monovalent high-dose IPV, which may have niches uh, boosting serologic immunity with a single dose, perhaps in an outbreak situation. And the thing that I want to close with is an, a potential innovation that I think could really serve to shift the paradigm uh, for these final stages, which is the development o of OPVs that do not revert back to neurovirulence. And as I you know, was learning about these viruses, you really found, I mean, my first instinct was like, why didn't we have these 25 years ago? We probably wouldn't be talking about this right now. But it's only recently that we've had the, the, the technological skill to develop, to engineer viruses that don't revert back to virulence, they don't have that downside. This is just a picture of a, of a, a manufactured uh, study site, biocontained study site called Poly Polyopolis in Belgium where they've completed phase one clinical trials uh, of these novel OPV2s and uh, studies are planned in the coming year here in Latin America for phase two trials. It has always been this kind of uh, irony of, of the end stages of polio eradication that when we have a, an outbreak of a CVDPV, for example, the response is to give a lot of doses of oral poliovirus. And so like fighting fire with fire. And so this type of thing has the potential to really shift the paradigm and may play a major role as we, as we move further into the end game. I just want to finish, uh, I suppose, you know, it's humbling work being part of such a huge process and it's been an honor to be, you know, part of a, a, a you know, a tiny part of that. Um, but when we talk about challenges or intellectual challenges, I always want to recognize that, the, that there are those ev every day out there today on the front lines of polio eradication and facing challenges that are of a different nature. Um, but absolutely, uh, you know, more important and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, to the actual success of the campaign. And so I want to acknowledge those efforts as well. I love this picture because it, most of the time you see 
you know, kids receiving oral polio vaccine, if you Google it and they're crying and someone's holding their mouth. But this kid, I think probably because the guy with the gun, he's not complaining. But obviously the vaccine worker here is risking her life and, uh, and, and uh, you know, we're really honored to be part of that. So, you know, thank you very much for the chance to speak. I know that in the audience, uh, there are many of you with uh, a lot of experience in, in determining vaccine policy around polio and experts in polio eradication. And so if we have a couple of minutes, I think it would welcome your perspectives and, and comments. Thank you.